Welcome to the Tailoring Talk magazine with your host, Roberto Rivilla. I'm so excited to be joined today by the author of Education is Freedom. Leading up to this, he was CEO of two huge household names, 7-Eleven and Blockbuster Video. Beyond his corporate achievements, he's a passionate advocate for education, believing deeply in its power to drive personal and societal freedom. As the author of Education is Freedom, he explores the profound impact education can have on individuals and society as a whole. Beyond his corporate roles, he's dedicated to helping and mentoring young adults, frequently speaking at business schools and conferences to share his experiences and insights on effective leadership and career development. In his spare time, he loves to learn from every experience and encounter He has also learned to fly and logged countless flight hours as a pilot, better than Harrison Ford, I've heard. Here to show us why change equals opportunity and share his amazing story, Tailoring Talkers, please welcome James Keyes to the show. James, how are you? I am excited to join you. This is going to be fun. It is. So... Before I drop you right into the action, the question I have to ask you before anything else. So I was very fortunate to be part of an audience when you were here in London recently. And I asked you some questions. And the second question was, I had to get you on my podcast because you mentioned a dream that you had that was really kind of quite a pivotal moment for you. And you couldn't go into detail about that dream with us but i swore i'd get you on my show and we would talk about that dream so over to you ah you're gonna make me dive right into all the all the the sappy stuff yes (laughs) we like sappy here (laughs) well yeah i i was um uh, like anyone else i i well first of all i've been blessed with an amazing um journey uh, from the beginning, having come from very humble uh, beginnings and uh, had some very good fortune along the way and used education as my tool to um, succeed. But like anyone else, in spite of all the amazing accomplishments that I've been fortunate to have, I still suffer, as we all do, from that little bit of an imposter syndrome. You know, am I am I good enough? Am I smart enough? We all do. I'm human, Right. And so shortly after being named CEO uh, of 7-Eleven, I was pretty young still at the time, uh, early 40s. And uh, I wanted to, I, I wasn't sure if, if if I was strong enough, smart enough, all that stuff was going on in my head. And I had a dream. And uh, um, in the dream, I was believing that perhaps I had died. In the dream, um, I, I'm sure you've heard of these out-of-body experiences that mm-hmm. people have, where they uh, have near-death experiences and they literally feel like they've left their body and they are, you know, in the presence of um, whoever, a uh, another amazing spiritual being out there, and and I'll leave it non-denominational, but. Um, I had that feeling of bright light, overwhelming feeling of love and warmth and 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 peace. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is this is what I hear people experience. I I, I think I don't think I've died. I'm sleeping, I, but I, I wanna I wanna experience this and I don't want to wake up. I was afraid to wake up and and miss the opportunity because I was told by this amazing spiritual force, this almost otherworldly force that I was going to get a gift, but I had to pass a test and I had to accomplish three things. So here I am in this dream, (laughs) struggling with the first assignment. And I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. And I, I struggled and I wasn't clear and I'm, you know, in and out of sort of semi-conscious dream state. And I came back after a while trying to struggle with this. What do I do? And I said, um, I know I probably have to change. I will do that. I can, I can change whatever I have to, to change. 
I will do it to be able to move forward. And I was given this in like metaphysical embrace. It was like, yes, you passed the first test. And I thought, oh, this is great. And then the second test comes. And I wasn't really sure what to do with the second test. And I was struggling with, oh boy, I'm not, it's not even clear. I'm not sure what to do. And how do I do this? And how do I accomplish it? And I came back and said, you haven't been clear with what I was supposed to do with this second test, but I can do it. Just tell me, just whatever it is, I know I can do it. I have the confidence that I can succeed. And again, I passed the second test. And it was um, confidence that I had to demonstrate. And then the third test was, I was given a, a task and it was a very complicated task and I didn't know if I could do it and I went away and I came back with a very, very simple solution. And again, I was rewarded with this incredible feeling of success now. You've passed the third test. Because what I did is I took this complex problem and I broke it into a very simple solution. In fact, I didn't think I was going to be successful because it was such a simple response that I gave. And the result was, now you've passed all three tests. Are you ready for your gift? And then I woke up. And I woke up before I got my gift. And I was so upset um, at having this beautiful dream. First of all, I didn't want it to end because it was so amazing. But then I woke up and I and I thought, oh my gosh, I, I didn't get my gift. And I, I tried to go back to sleep. And I, of course you can't. One of those early morning dreams. And uh, I jumped out of bed. I wrote down three words, the things that were in my mind, the three tests that I had passed. And it was change, confidence, and clarity. Those are the three words on the paper. Now, I didn't really understand what any of that meant to me. It was, just, it was a beautiful dream. I couldn't wait to tell people about it. And so I was asking friends, I said, what, what could this mean? I, I just, amazing dream. And everyone that I brought that to had the same response. They said, you, that's your gift. You already got your gift. You have this ability, Jim, to embrace change in any form. Good change, bad change. You could have the most devastating, soul-crushing event happen, and you'll find a silver lining in that cloud. You'll power through to get to the rainbow on the other side of a bad storm. And you're unfazed by change and able to embrace it and respond to it in a favorable way. And then secondly, you've got the confidence to do that because you believe you can do anything. So nothing phases you. You could have this devastating thing happen and your confidence will carry you through. And then finally, Jim, you're not really smart that smart <laughs> after all. And so your gift is an ability to take really complex problems and break them into, into simple solutions so that you can then deal with those problems. And better yet, you have a clarity of that communication to be able to understand the problem, but then explain the solution so others are able to follow you. So that is, Jim, that's your gift, the gift of change, clarity, and confidence that really uh, gave you the opportunity to be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And it's also a gift that should be given uh, to others so that they can help you by sharing that gift to make your company and you continue to be more successful. Yeah. Oh, that wow. That was my dream. Awesome. That's yeah. it. We're done. You can go now. <laughs> I got one of my... No. But, Mic drop. But, yeah. but um... <laughs> <laughs> confidence and clarity i think knowing some of your story um is something that you obviously had from an early age so let's let's now jump back in time a little bit so your your dad was a factory worker and factory worker yeah i want to say in massachusetts 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 i, I want to hear it. you say it Massa <laughs> Massa 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 
Do you know what? If Texas, I just say I'm... if I say it without thinking about it, then it's fine, right? I'm in Texas, and here the, the Texans call it Massa Massachusetts. <laughs> Massachusetts. Mass Massachusetts. Massachusetts. That's it. You got oh my... it. Massachusetts. Okay. Massachusetts. Oh my god. I'll even sure... make it worse. I come from a place called outside of Worcester. Worcester. Well, I know Worcester because we have oh, Worcester sauce. Yeah, the, that's right. Of course, you can say Worcester. No one in the United States outside of New England can say Worcester. They call it Worcester. Worcester yeah, exactly. Or Wor Worcester, Wor Worcester, something like that. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that's right. So, 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 Dad's a factory worker. So, working yes. class background. Snap. Yes. Um, but obviously, you know, he was a he was a profound influence on you because he believed strongly in education. Yes. And I'm guessing that, you know, he worked hard to make sure that you had that opportunity. Actually, he didn't know how. Ah, um, OK, because he didn't have that opportunity. Yeah, he <laughs> dropped out of school in the uh, sixth grade, I think it was, as did my mom. Mm. Uh, my mom was in and out of foster homes and uh, and just never had the opportunity to even complete high school. Uh, so neither of them really knew what to do. But they understood the power of education because as they looked out at the rest of the world, those who were successful were those who were educated. And they knew that somewhere in books was knowledge. And they did encourage me very strongly. Um, and little things happen when you're a kid. I, I remember um, reading and having my parents, both of them, and this is my, when I was five years old or or even fairly younger, some of my earliest memories were my parents making a big deal of the idea that I was reading. Um, wow, look at him. He's reading and and he's buried in those books. And and, I, and that was sort of a positive reinforcement to me as a kid. You know, you react very strongly sometimes to those positive things that your parents can can say or do. And so yeah, I had the the good fortune of somehow equating opportunity with knowledge at a very very early age yeah did did your parents ever talk when you were younger about social mobility and by that i mean if i can give you an example and i'm sure you come across this with a lot of the youngsters that you have worked with and helped and coached over the the years recently but you know i grew up in south london um very working class background, but my parents weren't maybe as encouraging as they maybe could have been. And I don't blame them for that. They were working extremely hard to try and keep a roof over our heads and just get day to day and put food on the table. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember I was always a dreamer. And, you know, I, I love movies, and I loved reading books. And um, I had such a vivid imagination. I still do. And my dream always, you know, I would look out of my bedroom window and wonder what the world was like out there and sort of just kind of be trying to figure out the Rubik's Cube of life. Like what combination would I need? Where would I need to turn it to get out of my situation and be something else? And I remember sharing that dream with my parents once and they both just kind of sat me down and said, you know, you're born working class, you're born working class. Don't try to fly further than your wingspan. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I, thankfully, yeah, I obviously didn't let that stop me. But there was always this push pull in my life where you imposter syndrome was very, very real at every single turn, every time I achieved something, or I felt like I'd got one foot up the, you know, one more rung up the ladder of life towards kind of climbing out of poverty and so on and, and, and making a much better life for myself, better than my parents had done for themselves. I would always then stop and maybe go back a couple steps because of you know, those words ringing in my ear and they still do to this day. Is this something that your your parents ever spoke to you about or that you hear frequently from the people that you you help nowadays? I, I had, I did, I, I, first of all, I hear it all the time. Yes, mm. there's so many people are trapped in their, uh, in their reality, which is not a reality. It's the, the perceived reality. Um, and 
and it's sad to see because, and that that's a big part of why I wrote the book and what I'm trying to do. Um, the, I, I had a different experience with my dad and, and here's why I think he had the privilege, privilege, he was in World War II <laughs> and was in Burma and uh, on the Burma road as a truck driver and building the Burma road. Yep. And he came back from that experience. He had never, most Americans had never been outside of the country. And all of a sudden, millions of Americans had these other experiences, many bad experiences of the war. But his, interestingly, was a good cultural experience because he saw poverty in a whole different light at that stage of his life. And even though we were poor, he came back from that and said, Compared to that, we're rich. You know, we can do anything here in America. So he had a very positive um, idea of what's possible. Now he didn't know how to get there himself. He, but he, but my dad was a bit of a dreamer. And the other thing he said about it, it wasn't really about. It had nothing to do with social mobility. Interestingly. Mm. His point was it was cultural mobility. And I'm so proud of my dad in, in hindsight, looking back, because here's just, you know, his background was probably Eng English, Irish, Scottish, whatever. And yet he was so fascinated by the Burmese culture and the people and what their thoughts were and their beliefs were that even with that little interaction that he had, he came back and said, you know, Jim, there's a big world out there. You need to, you need to explore it. You need, I want you to have these experiences. This is just one people, one culture, but imagine what's out there. So he was a, a, a cultural climber as opposed to a social climber. I guess I would characterize it. He wanted me to experience the world, not necessarily to go out and be rich. Big difference. Yeah. Huge difference. Yeah. Um. So it's, now in to go. Fact, in fact, it's why my book's not called "Education is Money." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. it's education is freedom because yeah, wealth is good, but it's 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 a it's a vehicle. It's a it's a it's a method of of being able to do things, but it's really freedom that was the essence of what he wanted me to experience. Yeah. So. The point I was going to make earlier before I then got distracted by something else, and this is going to happen a lot probably in the next half an hour, whatever we've got <laughs> left, by the way, um, was your, going back to your dream, clarity, confidence, that it's something that was always within you. You know, an early example being that once you graduated and you're, you know, interviewing and so on, and I, I, I don't know if it was your interview for um, Gulf Oil Corporation, um, where oh, I'll let you tell the story, but it was where you did something that the other candidates didn't do. You basically didn't BS yeah. the people that were in that that were interviewing you. Yeah, every I, I walked into an interview, and I, I it was an interview that had a prerequisite of an engineering degree, and I didn't have an engineering degree. And because yeah, so you you, you graduated as a lawyer, right? Well, I was I was uh, in a pre-law program at the time, uh, and it was uh, no, it was I'm sorry, JD MBA program that I was working towards, and I, I walked into uh, this oil company interview where the prerequisite was to be an engineer. And in the first five minutes, he looked at my resume and said, "You have a pol political science background. Why are you here?" And I said, um, I, "I kind of spun it into because." you're an oil company and you're surrounded by engineers and you need a different point of view. And I have a different point of view and I think I have something to offer. Uh, and he said, well, I don't want to waste your time. We've got, you know, I'm sure you've got plenty of other things to do. And I said, well, you've blocked this hour for me. So I'm going to use my hour if that's okay with you. <laughs> and it was just, I guess it was just brash enough that he sort of smiled, sat back and said, sure. All right, let's chat. And so we talked. And then at the end of the, um, interview he he was kind enough to say you know I, i'm gonna put you on the list i i think i actually think you could add value here and it was just an internship anyway so it wasn't uh that big a deal but it it, it was a good lesson for me that um in fact a friend of mine just just last week said gave me something really interesting he said 
forget about thinking out of the box. He said, Jim, what you're out telling people is to learn out of the box because there is no box. Box is in your head. And, and so that was my learning out of the box. It was like, there's no box just because it says you have to be an engineer. Who cares? That was a self-imposed limitation that I, I said, forget about it. I'm not going to let that limit me. Yeah. And probably put you, I mean, you know, not just then, but probably in the future in good stead over and above other kinds. So the problem that I always had, right, is that I'd be going for interviews and and even in tailoring, like I couldn't get into my industry um, because I didn't have a university degree. Right. So as far as they were concerned, I wasn't, quote unquote, educated. Right. Right. But they would have candidates alongside me that had degrees and so on and so forth. But, you know, I always thought I can, the one thing that I can do is I can think on my feet, I'm street smart. Yeah. Right. And that's the thing that I didn't learn in school. And it's something that you talk about in the book, you talk about education as a means to cultivate what, you know, whatever you want to term it, critical thinking, street smarts, and so on, just, you know, thinking outside the box. Um, and, you know, I guess that's one of the challenges these days, because you see so many kids coming out of school. I mean, certainly over here in, in the UK, I mean, you know, we have this view that our education system is far worse than the one in America. But, <laughs> you know, we get all our information from what we see on television and in movies. So, um, Which I guess is why you guys think that the Brits are so well dressed, um, which is <laughs> as you've been in London now. You can see that's not the case. Um, <laughs> but But, you know, kids come out. And one thing that the leaders that I work for and make clothes for constantly not complain, well, actually they do complain, is that they they see a lot of kids these days able to come out of university college, able to regurgitate information, but they can't, if, if they're faced with a problem in the moment, they don't know how to, I'll go back to my Rubik's Cube analogy, they don't know how to turn the sides to, to kind of problem solve in the moment. Right. It's true. Well, and 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 that's where um that's where the third leg of my uh gift stool, if you will, um comes into play. That that simplicity, that ability to to break problems into there's not there's no problem that can't be solved, right? Um, but we let ourselves get caught up in the in the confusion and frustration of trying to solve the problem and and yeah. we're often not able to just break it into its simple components. Yeah. But this is a problem for educators that that we kind of need to look at because yes. um because they're they're almost so let me step back a little bit. So so I was with uh, I was in a in a talk with Simon Alexander Wrong recently, and he gave the example of a study that was done where they got a bunch of people in the room, and I'm paraphrasing here, but they had a group of uh, graduates and a group, and you've probably heard this one, and they had a group of CEOs, leaders, and they gave them like a bunch of pasta mm -hmm. and a marshmallow and a roll of tape. <laughs> and they said you need to um you you need to build something to get that marshmallow up as high as you can propped up as high as you can and so the 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 graduates and well the the leaders they all kind of spent time sort of saying right well you know who's going to project manage this and who's going to lead the team and so on and you know by the time they did it, the time was up they hadn't really produced anything right so they spent all their time planning and so on and then the graduates were sort of coming at it from a more academic point of view so that you know the the tensile strength of the pasta compared to the salad tape right and the density of the marshmallow and stuff and so by the time the time was up they'd barely done anything yeah. there was a third group that i don't think they exposed groups one and two to and it was a group of children like age between five to maybe eight years old yeah they didn't talk they were so infused and fascinated by this task that they've been given that they just got straight on with it and who do you think the winners of the exercise were? The kids. children. Yeah. But it, but it, it seems that we're taking so so then you get the kid to sort of twenty one years old. They're out of college, and we seem to be 
draining that ability, that natural curiosity and ability to critical yeah. think, clarity yeah. of purpose. You give me a task. Okay, let me try. Let's just try and yeah. see what we come up with. We just take it out of them. Absolutely. So much, so much of what I put in the book comes back to things that are innate to human beings, critical thinking, curiosity, creativity. We're all creative as can be as kids, right? We sing at the top of our lungs. We dance like there's no tomorrow. And then at some point in our life, we're told, oh, that's not good, or that's not right, or it's not good enough. And so we we tend to suppress those natural, innate human characteristics. But ironically, they're so important to life. And, and so reigniting those is what I'm trying to do often in the book, um, that sort of reminder to people how important these things are uh, just in everyday life and being able to solve problems or be able to get along with other people. Yeah. Um, I've got did to I bring you, in, by the way, did sorry, I, did I give you the story of where I went to school, by the way, in, in the UK, I can't even remember if I, if I shared that, that I went, no, to but I know, I know you went to, um, I think it was Guildhall, but you were in Lewisham for a while in South London. I was in Lewisham. Yeah. 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 Where are you now? I, you said in South London, where, where are you? I, I, so I grew up in Croydon. So literally, okay. you know, KP from yeah. Founders Club. Yeah, he and I went to infant and junior school together, and we lived okay. two streets from each other. So we grew up in the same neighborhood. Ah, uh, okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, we didn't stay in touch. But so when we got to the age of eleven, and you go to secondary school, we got split up. So he went somewhere else, I went somewhere else, and we would just happen by chance to be reunited, like some twenty five years later. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was with the marketing manager for Porsche UK. And in yeah. that meeting, he said to me, you remind me of someone, do you know a Kalpesh Patel? And I said, oh, there's like 50 million Kalpesh Patels in the world, you've got to be more specific. And yeah. he said, look, you, you got to meet this guy. So anyway, they set the meeting up, KP walks through the door, it was like the past 25 years hadn't happened, we just hugged each other. And as you saw a few weeks ago, you know, here we are reunited today. So um, I had so. I had I had one of those experiences um with a buddy of mine. In fact, the reason I brought it up is I just left him. Um I was in the south of France last week in Monaco at his home. This is one of my schoolmates from Lewisham. Yeah. Uh, oh wow. His name is Mushtaq Malik. And uh we were both at Goldsmiths together. He was the coolest kid in school, absolutely the coolest. And so here I was, you know, a, a, an American and people didn't like me you know, when I got there because, well, because I was different and I was a little loud and brash. I was a typical American. Well, it's and, a shame, you know, because if I had a time traveling machine, I would go back when you're buying that two buck suit. Yeah, I probably I probably have you make a different life choice in that moment in time. <laughs> <laughs> I think like you may have. I know <laughs> yeah. it was the it was the bright blue bell bottom number, right? Yeah, the the bottoms were the bells were about that wide. In fact, <laughs> my buddy Mushtak last week was teasing me about my <laughs> shoes because I I had these big stack platform shoes that were very popular at the time, and he of course wore clogs because they were also very popular at the yeah. time. And uh, yeah, we were laughing about the old days. Um, but, you know, dial forward um, and here um, he didn't come from any kind of wealth at all. But interestingly, his parents, we now have three different points of view. Your parents said, know who you are, you know, and don't 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 think you can spread your wings. You're a working person. You're a working class person. His parents, for some reason, we literally just had this conversation said to him, you're better than anybody out there. You're you're like, think of yourself as royalty. And they didn't come from any wealth, but they infused into his mind this sense of confidence. And so he carried himself. And I, I remember as a kid thinking, wow, I wish I had the kind of self-confidence that Mushtaq has. 
because he carries himself as if he is some prince or something. And people yeah. treated him in that fashion. And I said, wait a minute now. You're supposed to be the minority. I'm supposed to be you know, the white guy here. And you, you, they're treating me worse than you. What's going on here? And it was a really fascinating, a fascinating um, education for me in the idea that it really doesn't matter the your your socioeconomic background, your race, your the color of your skin, your religion, none of that stuff matters. It's how you carry yourself, how you present yourself to the world. And um, and he had that sense of confidence that uh interestingly, I think I picked up from and I learned from him how how to not let myself be put in a box as an American, a Yankee. And so he taught me how to assimilate and yeah. to position myself, not just as a cricket player, I'm the best cricket player. So I walked on that pitch and I, and I was hitting sixes and people were going, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be able to play cricket, but I was a baseball player back home. So I had yeah. the athletic ability, but it was that confidence. I walked on that pitch and said, I can do this. And a lot of that came from my buddy Mushtaq Malik. Interesting. Amazing. Yeah, 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 totally. But but talking about not, you know, having the confidence to do anything despite and not being put in a box, you go from golf oil, I think you did about five years there. You go to Sitgo and you're there for about 11 years. And, and then they install you a law student who basically created a role for himself at the last firm <laughs> they install you as cfo of 7-eleven how does that happen yeah there were a few other steps along that journey but um <laughs> but it 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 came all the way full circle back to that confidence thing um it was that same attitude that I'm not going to let anybody else put me in this box and say what I am. So I discovered, and a lot of people do this along their career, you get labeled. You're a tailor. You can't be a business owner because you're a tailor. Um, or you're a an accountant. You can't be a marketer. You're not creative. You're an accountant. And And so what I tried to practice throughout my career is whenever I would get into one of those roles – that I was beginning to get pigeonholed. I was beginning to be called, well, you're a, you're a gasoline operator. Okay, raise my hand. I want another role. Put me in finance, but you don't know anything about finance. I'll learn. I'll take, a, I'll, I'll take less pay, but I want to learn that role. And so throughout my career, I was raising my hand, asking for other opportunities. And especially it would happen you know, we all get a bad boss, right? So I would get this boss that just, you know, ugh, I, I you know, just didn't, we didn't get along or he didn't respect my contributions or whatever, or he was jealous or a whole host of reasons for bad bosses. If I'd get in that situation rather than quit and leave the company, I'd just say, I want to, I want to work for this other department. And, and it was an, as long as it was a learning experience, I would go. So that was what helped me be named CFO. Ultimately, um, we had at one point a need for uh, general and administrative expense reductions because the company was going through some financial challenges. So I was the one who raised my hand and said, put me on the team. I'll go cut G&A expense. How are you going to do that? Figure it out. <laughs> And 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 that ultimately led to the role of CFO down down the road uh, because I had that both operating experience and financial experience within the company. Yeah, and it and it seems you kind of put all of that together because operationally you made some fundamental changes at Seven Eleven to help really revitalize the company and the brand, yeah. and they they went from you'll tell me in a second however many stores when you first joined to i think it was over 80,000 worldwide yeah, they, 
80, at the point now, that you left. Yeah. 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 Like just about 80,000 stores now. Um, and it, and it was, um, it, it really was a more a function of me being able to, uh, adapt to change. It was that, that change and change confidence and clarity. All three of those truly did propel my career and help to propel 7-Eleven because we were stuck. We were, we let people characterize us. So corporations have identities too, right? Just like people. <clears throat> so the rest of the world was saying, oh, 7-Eleven, you're, you're beer, soft drinks, cigarettes, and snacks. That's what you are. I was like, no, in 7-Eleven in Sweden, they have amazing fresh baked goods. In 7-Eleven in Japan, they have restaurant quality sushi. So we just haven't done that in the United States, but why not? So it was having the confidence to get out of that box that other people put us in. And it was very much, I mean, it's, it's the same thing as individuals that we let others dictate who we are and what we are, as opposed to saying, no, 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 I'm not that. I'm royalty, you know, yeah. as my buddy Mushtaq. As Mushtaq now. says, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he he wouldn't allow himself to be placed in that box. Today, by the way, he's a big real estate developer um, in, in Lewisham, um, has uh, developing a, a, a mixed um a mixed use uh um complex in uh, yeah. residential and business and everything it's fascinating the project that he has going there um but he was able to overcome those people who said this is what you do so even when he was in real estate he was doing real estate and people said well that's what you do in real estate he said no no no, no. watch this i'm going to do this big mixed use property and and, and and, and so businesses and people have that same need to get out of the box that others want to put you in. Yeah. I get people all the time. They're like, you have a podcast, you, you know, you've started a YouTube channel, you do this, you do that. And I'm like, yeah, why not? Because I'm curious as well. And like, when I see something other people do that looks like fun, I want to try it out. Right. Yeah. And what's the worst that can happen? It doesn't work out. And then I just learn from that. But you know, life's life's too short to be well, the right. Worst thing, so you could get some really boring guest that sits here and goes blah 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 blah, and I'm and you know like me, and I'd be boring. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, where I don't. By the time this goes out, it's probably gonna be like we're probably around about 180 episodes in. My my face hasn't hurt so much, Jim, from just constantly <laughs> smiling, and I I knew this was gonna happen because you have that effect on people. You're you're such a wonderful soul. So now saying Great that time. I'm going to, I'm going to take your wonderful soul. I'm going to pick you up and I'm just <laughs> going to move you forward a little bit in time. And I'm going to drop you into the heat of the action. You know where I'm going with this. I wonder if you'd, so Blockbuster, I've got to talk about it because a lot of our audience and my co-hosts were really excited. We have a lot of movie lovers because of the Bondathon that we do, where we've been watching the James Bond series, one movie, oh, yeah. one month at a time and reviewing them all. I saw the Connery movies for the first time. Who's your favorite Bond, by the way? Probably Sean Connery. Yeah. I can. I never had that because Brosnan was more my Bond. But, oh, yeah. yeah. But seeing the Connery movies from for the first time, my favorite Bond movie is from Russia with Love. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Sean yeah. Connery was just so cool. He just had that. And, 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 uh, of course, I, I'm old enough to, you know, go back to Roger Moore and, you know, some of the um, classic, uh, classic old Bond movies. But yeah, um, Blockbuster. <laughs> so Blockbuster right now, there's there's a for ignorant people or people who haven't really done their homework and looked into the story of the demise of Blockbuster. I don't like using that word, but anyway, it's too hot. Um <laughs> Evolution. evolution evolution of blockbuster devolution <laughs> of blockbuster um you know the 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 consensus is you say blockbuster to someone and it's like they got netflixed out of the business right they were this big behemoth that didn't change that didn't turn the ship around that didn't embrace new technology and from my research that couldn't be further from the truth what right. actually, right. and, and also owning a business, I know the importance of cash flow. Yeah. 
Yes. And so let me read this to you. I don't know if you've heard this before, right? But this is one of the articles that came out about the time that you were about to be installed as CEO and chairman. Yeah. Blockbuster takes a big gulp. I have no <laughs> idea where the Slurpee machine will go. Would you like some wild hogs beef jerky? How about pouring yourself some new Slurpee flavors like hot peach fuzz or berry blades of glory? If these aren't scenes from a blockbuster near you, give it time. The 7 Elevenization of Blockbuster is coming. And then the article continues because they talk about how Jim Keys is coming. And it and I this is a quote, okay? It's not me saying it. Uh, and investors are wondering how long it will take before all of his 7-Eleven flunkies and cronies come to join him and they turn Blockbuster into a convenience store. They were so scathing about your appointment. And I'm guessing it wasn't everybody, but a lot of the media, they love either a bad story or they love to create one out of nothing. Yeah. And so then we have this narrative that has continued for the last nearly 20 years or so, that Blockbuster got into trouble because it didn't innovate. And then it went out of business because Netflix and everybody else came up and so on. When mm. really, it was, I, from what I've read, it's 2008 is the conclusion I've come to as to, to why really with the financial crisis, you know, Blockbuster was under a, over a billion dollars of debt. Your priority coming in was obviously to technically innovate because you actually did launch streaming. And I yes. think you did that before anyone else. But then also, as all business owners know, you've got to get rid of the debt. You've got to get yourself into a position where you have cash that you can reinvest into the business. And if your lenders aren't lending or aren't helping you to refinance debt and so on, then you've got big problems. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Can we set the record straight? Sure. Well, what you described is exactly what we've been talking about. You can't let the world put you in a box and define who you are. And people were trying to put Blockbuster in a box and say, that's what they are versus Netflix. They were trying to put me in a box and say, here's a convenience store guy. Because I, 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 read, I read these things now. Oh, yeah. And now having, like having spent time with you and read your book, and obviously done a ton of research on you for obviously today. Um, none of it, uh, it's like they're writing, writing about somebody else. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's a narrative. And, and when yeah. a narrative takes off, it's hard to, it's hard to replace what people have in their heads. They've got their minds made up, but here's, here's the real story. I mean, you said, that article described me as a store guy, a convenience guy. Um, well, if you think about the core of Blockbuster's business, it wasn't renting DVDs. That was a delivery method for convenient access to movies. Yeah. That's a convenience business. Also, right? we, we really like getting our popcorn from Blockbuster because we knew it was <laughs> always in stock. Exactly. Exactly. But it was, I mean, think about it. It was the convenient access to those things that you wanted for entertainment, a movie, some popcorn, some salty snacks or candy to go with your movie, some drinks. And so it was a very natural extension of what I had spent 20 years transforming. I, I took 7-Eleven from beer, soft drinks, and cigarettes to a much broader odd, uh, offering of fresh foods and financial services and other things that people needed conveniently. So why not do the same thing for Blockbuster? That was what attracted me to the business. Now let's go to this question of, did they keep up with technology? Way before I got there, the year 2000, Blockbuster was partnered with a company called Enron. And no one knows this. People forget. Well, actually, they did, didn't even know it at the time because it was a sort of a secret project that Blockbuster and Enron were working on to create the first digital streaming entity. And this is in the year 2000. Yeah. Now, in the year 2000, Netflix 
had just started up and they were doing DVDs by mail and they were struggling. Their stock was about 70 cents a share. Um, they were a public entity, but they weren't being successful. So they actually did go to Blockbuster. There's another rumor out there that Jim turned down an opportunity to buy Netflix for $50 million, right? Well, that happened in the year 2000, seven years before I arrived. And, and Blockbuster looked at Netflix and said, well, anything you can do, we can do better, literally, because they already had the distribution uh, centers around the country. They had the DVDs to mail. So they, and they were, they had already started up a DVD by mail business. So there was really no need for a Blockbuster to buy Netflix um, at the time. But this idea that Blockbuster was slow to respond, they were way early in the year 2000 before anybody was even thinking about streaming. And then when I arrived in 2007, the very first thing I did was to acquire the premier streaming entity of the industry called MovieLink, a company that was created by six of the seven major studios with 3,000 titles already digitized because most of these movies were not yet converted to digital. But the studios had already digitized 3,000 of their best and newest movies. So we were sitting on a, on a digital capability that was far superior to the Netflix DVD by mail model. And then only when we turned down the opportunity to exclusively lock up digital content, which we had to do because of our financial situation at the time, when we turned down that exclusivity, then Netflix was able to stream a small assortment of old movies, which is how they started basically. So yeah, um, the Blockbuster, it's a myth that Blockbuster didn't. Prior to me, the management team saw it coming and was already on it. And when I got there, we then took it to the next level. Now, why did Blockbuster unfortunately close its stores and business model go away? That wasn't even me, basically. <laughs> it, was, it was the financial crisis that caused us to hit pause on the expansion of digital because we did have a billion dollars of debt and we had to get it refinanced. And in that two-year period from 2009 to 2011, we struggled to get a refinancing done when the banks were shut. But we were all during that time aggressively negotiating for distribution deals with Google, with Dish Network, with AT&T, with others, Korea Telecom, many others that had the ability to help us advance that digital model. Dish ultimately prevailed. They helped us with a prepack, well, with a not a prepackage, but with a Chapter Eleven restructuring, and they ended up buying the company. So it was really Dish Network that ultimately decided that they were going to close the stores and gave up the digital business to Netflix. Um, why did they do that? They weren't happy with the streaming capabilities of the day in 2011, and they had a very different vision for how streaming could and should uh, be facilitated. They may still one day, they own the Blockbuster brand. They may still bring that Blockbuster brand back with a superior business model. I really do hope that one day they do. And then maybe the naysayers will say, well, we were wrong. <laughs> yeah. And also for the record, the billion dollars of debt wasn't down to sort of mismanagement or Blockbuster being frivolous in any way. It was just one of those corporate things where a, a previous bigger entity that owned Blockbuster, I think it was Viacom, correct, loaded debt onto Blockbuster being one of its subsidiary companies, right? Which happens all the time in business. Look at Manchester United with the Glazers, most football clubs actually <laughs> these days. Um, so, so yeah. I, I get the, do you know, I was really thinking about this today because I was looking at, um, so I get alerts for new music from artists that I like, and you know, vinyls had such a big resurgence, especially yes. um, among younger people, but now artists are releasing their new music on cassette. Jim, have you seen this? 
No. No, like you remember the old C60? But... Yeah, like C60, C90s, like cassettes. Like we yeah. used to buy records back in the 80s, I guess. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, look it up. If you go on Amazon or whatever, look for like new music. Yeah. Um, so you can you can stream or you can buy on vinyl or CD or cassette now. <laughs> so this gives me hope. <laughs> this gives me hope that that one now independent blockbuster store in Oregon <laughs> may no longer be alone. I think that might be a stretch. Um, I, I, I too, I'm a vinyl fan, but I'm a vinyl fan because of the quality of vinyl. Yeah. In recording. But, I mean, I don't think people are going to go rent VHS tapes because yeah, the quality would be so bad <laughs> in an age of 4K TV and so on. But still, <laughs> there, there, there might be something there because there's this hankering for analog. Yeah. I mean, the resurgence of HMV, which was our biggest music store up until, you know, they went. And, right. and now they 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 have a couple of stores still remaining in this country, um, but they've had a big resurgence online, and it's all down to vinyl. So yeah. you know, yeah, we we should live in hope. We should always live in hope. <laughs> well, you know, um, it, it, the, the the we don't necessarily have to go backwards though, because no. what doesn't exist today is the complete aggregator. That's what Blockbuster was. They were an aggregator. You want an old movie, we got it. You want a foreign film, we got it. You want a video game, we got it. We brought it all together. You can't get that today online. You're not really no. sure where your favorite movie is. So someone could reemerge one day, which is the model we were trying to build yeah. as that aggregator. And uh, would it be under the Blockbuster brand? I hope so. Now, we've got to talk about education is freedom. Thank you very yes. much for the for the YouTube viewers there. Um, <laughs> so, firstly, where you, who pushed you to write this book? <laughs> the, by the way, this interview is so hard because I kind of know all the answers. But anyway, <laughs> I got to remember our audience um, because this is pretty big. I remember when you dropped this one on us, and like we were all like, "What? Oh my god! I want his cell phone." Um, <laughs> because it's very valuable. Well, I, I uh, the name Education is Freedom actually came from a foundation that I started um, 20 years ago when I was still at 7-Eleven, trying to inspire young people to do great things and uh, with through education. And um, one of my early uh, board members and friend uh, is a guy named Stedman Graham. And Stedman, um, he's just a great guy. He's written uh, 11 books or something like that himself. He's a very inspirational guy. He goes out and talks to young people about identity and, and exactly what we were talking about before. Don't let someone else determine your identity. Um, his, uh, and he's a great person to do it because uh, he uh, is a partner of Oprah Winfrey. And so when you're... Um, partner is of such amazing worldwide recognition, you have to be a pretty strong person with your own identity to be able to say, I'm an author. I have my own life. I have my own identity. Yes, she's my partner, but it, it, it's Stedman is a great person to be able yeah. to talk about the importance of having your own identity, not letting someone else shape it. And so uh, he was for years uh, encouraging me to take this message globally um, that young people all over the world and, and, and not just young people, but people all over the world need a reminder of the importance of lifelong learning and that, that these issues of identity um, are self-imposed um, restrictions that we, that we let others put on us because they label us as a thing or a, an identity uh, with your career or your race or whatever. And he's, and he's the best person in the world to be able to say, you gotta, you can't let anybody tell you who you are. And so he wanted me to, he really strongly encouraged me to get the book out. And frankly, it helps when you've got a friend who's an author, he's written 12 books and I didn't even know where to start. So he was able to give me uh, his literally a, outline format for the book proposal and how to do it and how to talk to publishers etc 
Yeah, no, that's so awesome. I mean, I, I'm going to put a link to Education is Freedom in the show notes. And if there's anyone that's listening to this that can't afford to buy a copy, um, click the text to show link in the show notes at the bottom of the show notes, and that will bring you directly to me and I will buy you a copy um, and gift it to you. Um, as I did with the copy that James kindly gave to me, which I have gifted in turn. Um, and then bought another. You, thank you for doing that, by the way. And I, I, I hope a million listeners actually um, call you out on that offer. It'll, it'll only be $20 million that you'll have to spend to buy everybody a book. But <laughs> I'm going to have to come to you for some refinancing of debt advice. Um, <laughs> but thank you for that. Thank you seriously for that. No idea problem. because I do want this book to be exactly as you described. To me, this is a gift book. It's yeah. a it, that that would be my dream that no one takes this book and puts it on the shelf and says, "Well, here's another in my in my library." That they read it and say, "I know three other people that really need this advice, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let each of them have a copy of this book to to read." Yeah, that'd be my I mean, dream. That- by the way, any of my clients listening to this, don't hit me up because you can all afford to buy the book and you should be, <laughs> and you should be buying it for people in your organization and so on. Um, I'm talking to my listeners who, and I know there are some of you who are struggling, who have a similar background to myself and you're trying to work your way up in the world. You know, part of why we do this show, aside from the Bond episodes, which are pandemonium quite frankly um is to try and help you so um so please do take me up on that offer um but you know one one thing that gets spoken to you a lot about is one of the coolest pictures on your instagram feed which is of snoop dogg holding education is freedom um and you know everybody says to you james that's so cool oh my god you're rubbing shoulders with snoop dogg but the important thing is and i'm sure this is what you think about first is the influence that people like him will have because millions of underprivileged people who need to be aware of this, be able to be, you know, have the opportunity to read that book, listen to your words, maybe even apply for the scholarship program, which we'll come to shortly. That's the importance of where education is freedom is going, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I I was very, very fortunate uh, throughout this journey uh, with the book to have people like Stedman help me out in the beginning. And then um, I, I didn't know Snoop Dogg at all, um, but I, I had met his son uh, through social media. He had reached out with some business questions. So I was able to have a good chat and met uh, his son, very bright kid named Cordell. Uh, and he's just, he's doing some amazing things in business. And he said, Hey, my dad would like a copy of your book. And I was thrilled a couple of weeks later when he sent back a copy with Snoop actually reading my book. It was, it was so cool because exactly as you said, what that represented to me was it was an opportunity to reach an, an audience that, you know, look at me, I, I, I walk into a high school and, you know, <clears throat> in a, in an underprivileged part of town and these kids are looking at me going, Oh yeah, sure. You know, you, you've never had any challenges in your life because it doesn't look like it. But, um, I walk in and throw a, you know, a, an image of Snoop reading my dog and I'm reading, reading my <laughs> book. <laughs> I have my, an image of my dog reading my book too, but, <laughs> but an image of Snoop reading my book. And it was instant cred with some kids that I would never otherwise be able to reach. Yeah. And, um, and I've got another, um, another, as you well know, um, I didn't know a guy named Jimmy Donaldson. I'd never heard of him before, uh, about a year ago. And I had the very good fortune to work with his head of philanthropy, um, a guy named Darren Margolis and, and Darren, uh, aware that I was writing a book said, Hey, maybe you'd like to partner with us. And uh, I had a a beautiful opportunity handed to me basically by Beast Philanthropy to be able to have Jimmy Donaldson hold up my book after doing shooting a video at a place called Ron Clark Academy, a very 
advanced school where they have great teaching techniques. And he brought 800, stu- 800 teachers in to this school to teach them this method of teaching to be able to engage kids. And at the end of the video, he held up my book and said, read this book, film a video saying why education is freedom, post it online at J Key's author, and you can win one of 10, $10,000 scholarships. I mean, that's, that's, I, I pinch myself for that kind of opportunity that was just handed to me. Yeah. Um, because I couldn't reach an audience of 260 million young people, which is what Mr. Beast has, 260 plus million subscribers. To have access to that audience was a gift, was indeed a gift. And so um, I'm grateful for those kinds of things, for Snoop Dogg, for Mr. Beast, for anybody else that that may help to, you know, to... Um, advance this mission and advance this message to people all over the world yeah i am i just had a thought um because linkedin likes long-form content and i keep forgetting to post on linkedin which is (laughs) actually where i should be posting because it's where my target customer audience is um but i think we're going to put this out on linkedin this will be the first um episode of the tailoring talk magazine to go out on LinkedIn because I've obviously got a big network of business leaders out there who are also connected to a big network. And then you know how it all grows and grows and grows. Sure. If there was something, what would you say to business leaders that are watching this on both sides of the pond? I would, I would say that businesses are like people. They're living, breathing organisms. They have life cycles and they have cultural issues and needs. And that what I've discovered is that the same principles that helped me succeed as an individual help the businesses succeed. A business has to respond to change. A business has to have an identity and the confidence to get out of its box, if you will. A business has to focus on clarity for its customers and its and its uh, and its stakeholders, um, and so all of these same principles that apply to us individually um, apply to business, and that's why I I, I hope um, I hope this book does become adopted by corporations. If I was still running a Fortune 500 company, I would make sure that everyone in my company had a copy. Um, because I think it would help as a team. These are the things that I taught my team at 7-Eleven. These are the things I taught my team at Blockbuster. And I think any team could benefit from uh, the collective ability to work together and, and, and put these principles in place. Thank you. I couldn't think of a better way to end this. Um, and anyone out there that's wanting to get in touch with james he's extremely busy his online presence is growing um he's making some like your little reels that you do where you're you're somewhere and then it's like where are you going next and you do your kind of elvis little sort of shake your hands and stuff and then you (laughs) jump and then you're in wherever it is that you're going next they're so cool i just wanted to let you know that um (laughs) But um, but people can reach out to you because you're one of the most approachable, successful people that I have the privilege of knowing, like ever. And I know you can't get to everybody, but you do you do try your best, don't you? I, I'm trying to be accessible. Um, and and you know, it's it's one of those things you just never know. Um, you never know. And I I've got a <clears throat> one of the things in the book that I uh, am most proud of is like, and maybe I, we can end on this. I, I have always struggled because when you have a lot of confidence, you have to be careful that you don't cross that line into arrogance, right? But I discovered from a guy named Norman Vincent Peale, a wonderful definition of that difference. And what he taught was equal doses of confidence and humility. But his message about humility was so important because basically it was, you're smart enough to know what you don't know. 
and that it's a recognition that every human walking this planet also has something that you can learn. And you don't know what it is, but if you can find that ability to tap into every other human and to seek from them, what can I learn from you? And to be able to ask the right questions and to genuinely be interested enough in that other person that you can learn from them. That's a principle that I've been trying to embrace because it's so true. I can learn from people from all over the world. And the more I have that experience, the more interesting I become as a person, because now I'm the collective patchwork quilt of everybody I've ever encountered. So that's why I try to make myself as accessible as possible, because I don't know what I'm going to learn from you today, uh, but I'm blessed with the privilege of having the opportunity to see what I might learn. And I have, in fact, learned from you today, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Thank you so, so much, James. Um, and that just beautifully brings full circle what I said at the top in my introduction, that in your spare time, uh, as well, we didn't get to talk about you flying planes and things, but we'll have an op another opportunity, hopefully, if you dare come back. Um, <laughs> but you do love to learn from every experience and encounter that you have in life. And that is so beautiful. And it's so inspirational. James, thank you so much. Thank you for your time as well and for being so generous. Have you had fun today? I have had a blast. And thank you for making it fun. And uh, I appreciated all the kind words. And uh, I, I do want to come back. So let's uh, we'll do this again. And we'll talk about fun things. We'll talk about flying and uh, <laughs> and adventures. Yeah, that'd be so awesome. And also the things that you've learned from flying as well, because I have a whole pocketbook of notes on that that I've learned oh, yeah. from you. Um, <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining James and I. If you got something from this episode, please pay it forward and use the share button in your podcast player to forward it on to someone you know who might get some help or be inspired by what James shared with us today. You can support the show by liking, following, subscribing and reviewing. That's how the algorithms bring more people to this and you never know who's going to need some help. We love your feedback. So join in the conversation if you're watching on YouTube or LinkedIn and hit the text to show link in the show notes to send us a message. Remember, you can follow us on Instagram at Taylor and Talk for episode news and updates. I'll put James's links in the show notes too. Have a great week. Be good to each other. And I'll catch you on the next one.